الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد Again we're talking about the merits and the excellence of fasting The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم mentioned that fasting intercedes for us on the day of judgment So he says in the authentic hadith reported by Imam Ahmad قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الصيام والقرآن يشفعان للعبد يوم القيامة يقول الصيام أي ربي منعته الطعام والشهوة فشفعني فيه ويقول القرآن منعته النوم بالليل فشفعني فيه فيشفعان Allah's Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم says that fasting and Quran will intercede will intercede for the servant on the day of judgment Fasting would say أي ربي منعته الطعام والشهوة Oh my Lord I prevented him from eating and from drinking, from food in general, and from his desire, sexual desire. So let me intercede for him. That means, you know, accept my intercession and protect him from the punishment because of me. Because of me, protect him from punishment or from any kind of chastisement. And the Quran would say, Oh Allah, I have prevented him from sleeping at night because he used to recite Quran, he used to pray at night. So let me intercede for him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept their intercession. So that means when we are fasting, basically, you are gaining credit with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, preparing for something to intercede for you. So what this actually shows that fasting will take a personality, will take a figure on the day of judgment. And this is something part of the unseen. We don't know how this will be. Uh, Another, another aspect of siyam or fasting is that it expiates our sins. It washes away our sins and that's a very powerful aspect. So when you are fasting, when you are experiencing the hunger and the thirst and the tiredness and the disruption of your daily routine, remember that this is not in vain. It's not in vain because fasting is one of the best ex expiations of sins. Kafara. It's a kafara from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that in Islam, oftentimes you will find a lot of the kafarat or the expiations if you do something wrong, is that actually you fast. So for example, someone who may, makes dhihar, he says to his wife, you are like my mother to me. We know that this person cannot go back to his wife unless he obviously frees a slave. If they, he cannot find this, cannot afford this. He uh, fasts 60 days. He fasts 60 days. And a person who kills another one without intention, by mistake. The kafara for al-qatl al khata For murdering someone by accident. You don't intend. Like you're driving someone, you know, just pushed into your way and you happen to run them over and they pass away. You didn't intend to kill anyone. But if that person dies, you have to make a kafara, which is fasting 60 consecutive days. So it shows that fasting is such a great act of worship and it expiates some of the great and grave consequences of some of our actions. And uh, there's a hadith reported where uh, Umar al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu, he, when he was the Khalifa, he was with the companions of the Prophet and so he said, أَيُّكُمْ يَحْفَظُ حَدِيثَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ فِي الْفِتَنِ Who among you knows the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? about the times of fitna. So Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, Umar al-Khattab knows that Hudayfa knows the hadith, so he wants him to talk about it. He wants him to talk about it. Because Hudayfa would not speak so often about these things. But Umar wanted Hudayfa to speak about it because Hudayfa is called Hafidhu Sirri Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He learned a lot of things that the Prophet did not disclose so much or so often to the public. Because he used to ask very uh, intelligent questions and for example the names of the hypocrites the Prophet was informed by Allah about the hypocrites who pretended to be companions so the Prophet knew them by name he didn't disclose their names except for or except to Hudayf ibn al-Yaman this is where Umar al-Khattab one day came to him and he said أَعَدَّنِي أَوْ أَسَمَّانِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ فِي الْمُنَافِقِينَ did the Prophet mention my name when he told you about the hypocrites was I one of them Hudayf al-Liman said, La, 
ولا أجيب أحدا بعدك أو غيرك. He said, no, and I'm not going to answer this question if anyone asks me after this. So, because Umar al-Khattab really like he was pushing Hudayfa to answer this question. So one day Hudayfa asks the companions of the Prophet and he wants Hudayfa to speak out. So he says, who amongst you knows the hadith of the Prophet about the fitan, the fitan towards the end of time? Uh, Hudayfa uh, radiallahu anhu, he doesn't want to go there so he gives an answer and he says, fitnatu rajuli fi ahlihi wa malihi wa jarihi tukafiruha salatu wa siyamu wa sadaqah. He says the fitna, the general fitna, the trials, the tests, the mistakes that we fall into, usually when it comes to how we treat our families, our kids, and uh, how we deal with our money, sometimes we don't make optimal decisions. Sometimes we buy something we're not supposed to buy, or we don't place the money where it should be. Or sometimes we might get money from shady sources, right? We all sometimes go into these shady areas sometimes, maybe knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. And... Uh, and even the trials that we have with our neighbors, meaning not giving our neighbors their rights, which is something hugely neglected these days. Hudayf ibn Iman says, all these sins and shortcomings will be expiated by salah, praying, and by siyam, fasting, and by sadaqah that you give. So that shows that fasting is actually a great uh, act of worship that expiates and removes our sins. So when you are fasting, you should imagine and you should really visualize that your fasting is removing a lot of your sins. If you do it sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just to finish the hadith of Hudayf ibn al-Yaman uh, when Umar radiallahu anhu asked who knows the hadith of the Prophet in the fitan. Uh, so when Hudayf radiallahu anhu said, you know, the fitna that you have in your family and your money, your wealth, in your neighbors, it will be expiated by salah, by fasting and by sadaqah. Umar al-Khattab said, ليس عن هذا أسأل. I'm not asking about this. إنما أسأل عن الفتنة التي تموج كموج البحر. He says, I'm asking about the fitna that is so huge, like the waves of the ocean, like the huge, gigantic waves of the ocean. And by the way, this, is, this kind of analogy or this kind of metaphor, we don't really appreciate it. For the Arabs, especially in the Arabian Peninsula, the thing that they were scared of the most was riding the sea, sailing, sailing. So the Arabs for them, they would go for death, but not sail in the ocean, in the sea. For them, it was like the, the, the scariest thing. So the Arabs feared that. The Arabs feared the sea completely, completely. So this was a very big thing, very big cultural thing among them. So when Umar al-Khattab says, I'm asking about the fitna that is like the gigantic waves of the ocean, he's talking about something truly serious. Truly, truly serious. Okay? Uh, so Hudayf ibn Yaman said, Laysa alayka minha ba's, ya amir al-mu'mineen. He says, O oh, chief of the believers, you have nothing to fear about it. فَإِنَّ بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهَا بَابًا مُغْلَقًا because you don't have to fear this fitna, this gigantic fitna. Because between you and this fitna, there is a, a locked door or gate. Umar al-Khattab understands this kind of symbolic language. He's very intelligent. So he says, أَيُكْسَرُ الْبَابُ أَمْ يُفْتَحْ He says, this door, this gate that's between me and the fitna, will it be opened, unlocked, or will it be knocked down? He said, بل, uh, uh, He said, الباب أم يفتح? So is it knocked down or is it, will, be, will it be unlocked? So meaning the door, will it be opened with peace or will it be an aggressive way to open that fitna? So Hudayf ibn Yaman says, بل يكسر يا أمير المؤمنين. It will be knocked down. The door will be broken. So Umar al-Khattab shows you the deep understanding of the companions. So Umar al-Khattab says, إِذَنْ لَا يُغْلَقُ أَبَدًا Umar al-Khattab says, then this door will never be locked again. The students of Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, they did not speak in the presence of Umar. Umar al-Khattab has this hayba, has this you know, respect and presence about him. People feared to ask him. Even Abdullah ibn Umar anhu 
had some fiqhi opinions that were against the fiqhi opinions of Umar ibn Khattab. He never disclosed them <laughs> until Umar ibn Khattab passed away. That's Abdullah ibn Umar, his son. And Abdullah ibn Abbas is a keen student of Umar ibn Khattab. Abdullah ibn Abbas is a keen student of Umar ibn Khattab. He himself had opinions he only disclosed when Umar ibn Khattab passed away. His hayba, this kind of respect about the presence of Umar ibn Khattab. So the, the students of Hudayfa did not ask in the presence of Umar. Later on, they went to Hudayfa and they said, does Umar ibn Khattab, uh, what does, uh, does Umar ibn Khattab know what it means for the door to be broken? They ask, does Umar al-Khattab know what is this door, what is this, you know, metaphor referring to? Hudayf ibn Iman said, yes, indeed, he knows. He knows it just like you know before tomorrow is today. So who's the door? It's Umar ibn Khattab himself. And when the door is broken, it's when he was murdered or assassinated by Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi. And this is why by the death of Umar ibn Khattab, the fitan started. So, subhanallah, Uthman radiallahu anhu became the Khalifa and then later on, start, a lot of the fitan started to come from, mainly from Iraq. Mainly from Iraq. So the Khawarij appeared, and the roots and the seeds of Shiism also started to appear at that time. And this is why during the Khilaf of Uthman عنه, towards the end of it, there was a great fitna to the point where a lot of the companions left Medina because they could not stay in Medina because of all these people, the Khawarij who were living in, in they were trying to kill Uthman عنه, all of them, they were in Medina and they spoiled everything about Medina. So many of the companions left. Anyway. Let's go back to fasting. Some of the excellence of fasting. The Prophet ﷺ promised a special, particular gate in paradise for the fasting people. And he وسلم, said in the hadith reported by Bukhari and Muslim, إِنَّ فِي الْجَنَّةِ بَابًا يُقَالُ لَهُ الرَّيَّانِ يَدْخُلُ مِنْهُ الصَّائِمُونَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ لَا يَدْخُلُ مِنْهُ أَحَدٌ غَيْرُهُمْ فَإِذَا دَخَلُوا أُغْلِقْ فَلَمْ يَدْخُلْ مِنْهُ أَحَدٌ فَإِذَا دَخَلَ آخِرُهُمْ أُغْلِقْ وَمَنْ دَخَلْ شَرِبْ وَمَنْ شَرِبَ لَمْ يَظْمَ أَبَدًا This hadith, the Prophet ﷺ says, in Jannah there is a gate called Ar-Rayyan. And Ar-Rayyan means basically quenching the thirst. When you quench thirst, like someone is too thirsty and they drink water, this kind of sensation being quenched and satisfied, this is what Ar-Rayyan means. When you get enough water after thirst. The only the fasting people will enter Jannah through this gate called the Rayyan, and once they enter it, it will be locked. No one else will be allowed to go through it except for those who observe the fasting. And whoever enters this, they would drink, and whoever drinks, they will never go thirsty. And that's obviously in paradise. Let's talk about Ramadan. Ramadan, first of all, is the month of fasting, or the month of the Quran. It's the month of the Qur'an. شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ Month of Ramadan in which the Qur'an was revealed. So there's a special, very strong connection between fasting, between Ramadan and the Qur'an. There's a very strong connection. And in Ramadan, we know that the uh, devils, especially the main, the tyrant one, the giant, the giant devils, the giant among the jinns, these will be chained and locked, as the Prophet ﷺ says. And the gates of paradise will be open, the gates of hellfire will be locked. This is only during Ramadan. So this is an excellence, some kind of exceptional uh, thing that happens and takes, uh, takes place during Ramadan. In Ramadan there is Laylatul Qadr, the night of power which is greater in the sight of Allah than a thousand months, which is about... 82, 83 years. Such a profound time in one night. So if a person worships Allah during this night, it is as if they worshipped Allah for all this time. This is why deeds are multiplied beyond imagination in this, in this night. Uh, 
so fasting Ramadan is a is an excellent tool to to remove our sins. The Prophet sallallahu says in the hadith reported by Bukhari and Muslim, he says, "Man sama Ramadan iman and wahti saban ghufir lahu ma taqaddam min dhambi." Whoever fasts Ramadan, iman and out of faith in Allah, out of faith in the, out of belief in the reward from Allah and in the excellence of fasting with Allah subhanahu wa taala and seeking reward, ihtisab, seeking Allah's reward. Even though there is hardship in fasting, there is discomfort. You do this for the sake of Allah, so you give up on your own desires for the sake of what Allah loves. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, all, your, all the past sins of that person will be forgiven. All of them will be forgiven. I mean, who doesn't want their, their sins to be forgiven? We commit sins day and night. Most of the time we are committing sins. So with fasting, if you fast Ramadan, the whole of it completely, and you do that out of belief in Allah, and belief in the reward from Allah, and seeking Allah's reward, then inshallah, this would expiate and remove all of your sins, all of your past sins. And the Prophet says in another, another authentic hadith, As-salawatu al-khams wal-jumu'atu ila al-jumu'a wa ramadana ila ramadan mukaffiratun lima baynahunna idha jtunibat al-kabar. The five daily prayers, one after the other, and praying Jumu'ah after Jumu'ah. And then Ramadan, worshipping Allah, fasting and, and praying and, and reciting the Quran. Ramadan, after Ramadan, this removes the sins. This removes the sins, specifically if you abandon or if you avoid major sins. If you avoid major sins. In an authentic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ one day mounted the minbar. He got on, on the minbar. So the first step he said, Ameen. The second step he said, Ameen. Third step he said, Ameen. The companions were puzzled. Now the Prophet ﷺ doesn't do this. So now he is saying Ameen three times and we don't know what the, what's the, what the context is. So afterwards they asked him, they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, when you, you know, stood in the member, you said, Ameen, 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 three, three times. What does this mean? The Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّ جِبْرَائِيلَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ أَتَانِي فَقَالْ مَنْ أَدْرَكَ شَهْرَ رَمَضَانَ فَلَمْ يُغْفَرْ لَهُ فَدَخَلَ النَّارِ فَأَبْعَدَهُ اللَّهِ قُلْ آمين فَقُلْتُ آمين. To the end of the hadith which is about مَنْ أَدْرَكَ وَالِدَيْهِ وَلَمْ يَدْخُلْ بِهِمَ الْجَنَّةِ فَأَبْعَدَهُ اللَّهِ قُلْ آمين فَقُلْتُ آمين. And وَمَنْ ذُكِرْتُ عِنْدَهُ فَلَمْ يُصَلِّ عَلَيْهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. So the Prophet, when the companions asked him, why did you say Ameen? He said, Jibreel came to me and he said, any person who witnesses the month of Ramadan and he doesn't get his sins forgiven because of Ramadan, then may Allah distance him from his mercy and from paradise. Say Ameen, I said Ameen. So that's a dua from the best of the angels and Ameen is said by the best of humanity and the best of the creation. This is absolutely an answered dua by Allah. And whoever, you know, uh, lives and uh, witnesses the old age of his parents and he doesn't enter paradise because of his dutifulness to, him, to them, because of taking care of them, then may Allah distance him from his mercy and from paradise. Say Ameen, I said Ameen. And anyone in whose presence the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned, he doesn't say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then may Allah distance him. Say Ameen, I said Ameen. And in, in, in Ramadan, the dua is accepted. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees people from the hellfire each night. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says in this hadith, reported by Ahmad again, it's, it's sahih. Inna lillahi fi kulli yawmin wa laylatin utaqa'a min al-nari fi shahri Ramadan. Wa inna li kulli muslimin da'watan yad'u biha fa yustajabu lahu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, in the month of Ramadan, in each night and in each day, there are people that Allah will free from the hellfire. Each night, there are, there's, a, there's a, a quota that Allah will free from the hellfire. Each night and day, based on what they do, based on how sincere they are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for every Muslim, there is a da'wah that they can call, there's a dua that will be answered by Allah. That means every day and every night in Ramadan. 
So this shows this is a, a very special time and we should not miss out on this. So what you can do is increase in dua and increase in worship. So don't forget to make dua during the day and during the night. Hopefully you will you know, coincide with that time when the dua will be accepted during that night or that day. And, uh, you know, failing to fast Ramadan when one is able and not exempted, one doesn't have any rukhsa, and they fail to fast, they neglect to fast, this is a grave sin. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith of Al-Isra' wal miraj in one part of it, he mentions that he came across a people who were hanged by their hamstrings, sort of by their ankles and hamstrings, they were hanged or they were hung, okay? And their cheeks were cut with scissors. Their cheeks were cut with scissors and they were bleeding. Their cheeks were bleeding. So the Prophet ﷺ said, who are these? These are the people who eat before it's time to open the fast, which is Maghrib. That means people who do not observe the fast. The hadith in Arabic, that part, حتى إذا كنت في سواد الجبل إذا بأصوات شديدة قلت ما هذه الأصوات قالوا هذا عواء أهل النار ثم انطلق بي فإذا أنا بقوم معلقين بعراقيبهم مشققة أشداقهم تسيل أشداقهم دما قال قلت من هؤلاء قال الذين يفطرون قبل تحلة صومهم So it's a grave sin to fail to observe the fasting of Ramadan Imagine this punishment even the description of it is disgusting, makes you feel sick. So that's, it shows it's a grave sin not to observe fasting. So inshallah tomorrow we will start talking about the rulings of, that pertain to fasting. So if you have a couple of questions, we can answer them inshallah before we leave. Any questions? Any questions? Yes. Yeah. No, this is in Ramadan, fi Ramadan. This is special for Ramadan. People are freed from the hellfire by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the day and the night. That's only for Ramadan. So Obviously, there will be people throughout the year, but this is, a pri this is a specific privilege for Ramadan. This is exceptional in Ramadan. Now, Bab al Rayyan, obviously, ideally, it's for the people who fast Ramadan, but the people who observe fast outside Ramadan will have more priority. Yes. So, a person who observes the obligatory fast in Ramadan, they're absolutely entitled. Wallahu alam, this is how it seems to be. Because this is a, a door or a gate for Lissa'imeen, for the fasting ones. So, if you fast Ramadan, all of the Ramadans, and that means also the quality of your fast. So someone fasts, but they keep using bad language, getting into arguments, mistreating others. Okay, the level of their fasting or the reward for their fasting is much less. And this might affect their eligibility to enter through this gate. Yeah. Everything is, you know, is relevant there. Any more questions? I can take one more. So is it when you die during the fast, or is it even after the Ramadan you die? And you're not fasting, but you get, go through heaven, the gate, only because you... No, the gate has nothing to do with you if you die in a state of fasting or afterwards. No. It has nothing to do with the time you die. As long as you fast. Yes. Yes. As long as you fast, inshallah, at least the obligatory fast, inshallah, you'll be qualified for that, inshallah. Tayyip, barakallahu feekum. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.